Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to be looking at equilibrium. So this is a fairly short topic similar to kinetics and if you did the higher tier GCSE you should have already covered most of it. So we'll dive straight into it. It introduces this symbol, a reversible reaction. Most reactions you'll have seen so far have just had the simple straight arrow like that. In other words, all reactants turn into products. What dynamic equilibrium introduces is the fact that nitrogen and hydrogen can combine to give ammonia, but ammonia can also break apart to give you back hydrogen and nitrogen. So a reversible reaction is one where the products can change back into the reactants. Now, for introducing what dynamic equilibrium is and getting onto the exact definition of it, we're going to look at this graph. So at time zero, we've got some reactants. So in other words, all nitrogen, hydrogen, sorry, reactants up there. The products would be zero down here. Time zero, nothing's reacting, so no products. As time proceeds, obviously the reactants get used up and the products form. Now when you are looking at this, you may think, be thinking that all reactants are just turned into products. You're puzzled a bit about why this is left over here. It's because they are actually flicking between the two states. Some of the reactants here is turned into the product, but some product are also turning back into the reactants. So I'm going to mark on that graph where dynamic equilibrium is being reached. roughly around there. The definition of what dynamic equilibrium is, is when the forward and reverse rates are the same. So linking back into this, every time one nitrogen and three hydrogens react to give you two moles of ammonia, at the same speed, two moles of ammonia are breaking apart to give you three moles of hydrogen and one mole of nitrogen. So forward and reverse rates are the same. Now because of that, as soon as you're generating some ammonia, the same amount that you generate is breaking apart to give you back the nitrogen hydrogen. Then the other part of the definition is that the product and reactant concentrations remain constant. So forward and reverse rates are the same, product and reactant concentrations remain constant. Now in some books they say remain the same and some people get a little bit confused over that. I'll show you why in a second. So usually you'll see a graph like this. However, it is perfectly fine to see a graph that would look like this. meant to be flat. So notice that we've actually finished with more reactant than product. You could have it where they were exactly 50-50 and when some people see that definition for dynamic equilibrium they assume that must be the case. Not true. They can be 50-50, you can finish with more reactants than product or you can finish with more product than reactant. It all depends on the conditions you do the experiment under. You do encounter things like this in everyday life. Ethanoic acid is an example. Ethanoic acid usually stays in its reactive form. Not much of it converts into product. When it turns into the product, it releases hydrogen ions, hence why it's an acid. However, if it was a strong acid, in other words, it went all towards the product, it would release that many hydrogen ions Having fish and chips with vinegar would be a very rare delicacy for you because after your first attempt, you'd probably be lacking a throat. So that is where you encounter an everyday life. Okay, now what we are going to look at is Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle, you need to know the definition for this as well. It's where a system in dynamic equilibrium is disturbed then the system will move in the direction to oppose the change. 
So it's a little bit stroppy, usually referred to as the law of teenagers. So you've all met those teenagers who don't do what they are told, they always just refuse everything, think they're the best, may even have some in your class. So it's a case of, could you be quiet? They continue jabbering louder. Do your homework, and they just lay around playing on the computer. So what you have to do with this is apply more or less a little bit of reverse psychology to try and get what you want. So what I could do is say, don't do your homework, Go and work in McDonald's on that late night shift and serve fries to drunken obese chavs who will hurl verbal abuse at you. And hopefully that should get the desired results of some homework being done. Right, now you should be familiar with this reaction. It is the Harbour process. So it is the production of ammonia. It was very important at the time the world was pretty dependent on raw materials to get nitrogen out and Fritz Haber, very clever guy, managed to use some nitrogen hydrogen, readily available element, to make it. So we can use ammonia to, uh, to get the nitrogen for fertilizers and half the world's food production is dependent on that. Uh, a little bit of history, Fritz Haber for you. He got a Nobel Peace Prize and then also a little bit of irony went to the dark side and became known as the father of chemical weapons. But, hey, peace through superior firepower and the use of it, well, it's a question of ethics for philosophers. And death is death, to quote the man himself. So what we need to look at is the factors which would affect the position of this equilibrium. Because when you work in industry, obviously the main goal of every scientist is money. more you earn, the better. As soon as you make your millions, you can retire, lays about on a beach with pretty girls in bikinis. Or guys if you're female. So we want to look to try to make as much ammonia as possible. Now there are a few factors which would affect the position of the equilibrium. So temperature. Concentration, and pressure. Now some of you may start jumping ahead thinking surface area, catalyst, so forth, similar to the kinetics. However, those two do not affect the position of the equilibrium. Only these three do. So if you change any of these three, you will be disrupting the position of the equilibrium. So in other words, you will mess up that dynamic equilibrium that it's got set up. A system in dynamic equilibrium is what's termed closed and by changing these you are breaking open that closed system. You are changing a condition and the position of the equilibrium needs to move to counteract what you are doing. Now we'll tackle this in sort of an exam style format. When you are asked questions in the exam, there is always a few points to follow through. So I'll write the, the method down, the three steps you should go through, and then we will tackle this process together going through some of them. One, state Captain Obvious. We'll come on to it. Mark schemes seem to love it for some reason. Two, position of equilibrium. Simply, does it move to the left, move to the right, or forward reverse if you want to describe it that way. And why? Why does it move that way? Right, so we will work through these three factors. I will start with the easiest one, pressure. Now pressure relies on the number of moles of a gas. Ignore any solids or liquids you see. 
Usually they'll make it easy, they will just use a homogeneous reaction at this level, so it's a bit easier. You will typically be showing all gases. But if they do throw in liquids or solids, ignore them. So in this reaction, in the harbor process, you want to look at how many moles of gas do I have in the reactant, how many moles do I have in the product. So 3 plus 1, easy enough. 4 moles of gas in the reactant. 2 in the product. So if you ask the question, what would be the effect of an increase in pressure on the harbour process? State Captain Obvious first. There are more moles of gas on the left hand side, or the reactant side. Literally, you will get a mark for that. Now for the position of the equilibrium, pressure. Le Chatelier's principle, if you increase the pressure, the system will try to decrease the pressure. So if you increase the pressure, the way it does that is it always moves to the side with the fewest gas molecules. In other words, it sticks some of these together and makes fewer gases. So that will reduce the pressure. So the position of the equilibrium in this case, if I increase it, will move to the right. And the reason why is to reduce the pressure. Three marks for that, nice and easy. Now in terms of the rate and such like that, what you can get asked, and get asked on as well, that starts to link in a bit of kinetics. So if I increase the pressure, the forward rate and the reverse rate will both increase. Because if you are crushing things closer together with pressure, then there is more molecules within a confined space, so there is more likely to be successful collisions. If I decrease the pressure, then the reverse is going to be true. The system will want to try and increase the pressure. So if I decrease the pressure, state the obvious, again there is more gas moles on gas molecules on the left. So a decrease in pressure will move the position of the equilibrium to the left. And why? Well it tries to restore the pressure, it tries to increase it. So that's pressure, nice and easy. Next we will look at concentration. Concentration, imagine we increase the amount of hydrogen here. What does the system want to do? Well, it wants to oppose it, it wants to try and decrease the amount of hydrogen. So if we increase it, how is it going to do that? Well, it's going to combine some of the hydrogen with the nitrogen and throw it across to make the ammonia because it's going to try and reduce the amount of hydrogen back down. So obviously that will push up the amount of ammonia, but it will also drag down some of the amount of nitrogen because it's got to combine this with the hydrogen to form ammonia. Easy way of imagining it is like a set of scales. So in dynamic equilibrium, scales are nicely balanced. System is happy. However, being the cruel person you are, you add some hydrogen and unbalance it. So you've added hydrogen to this side, to the reactant side. You've made it heavier. Well, easy metaphor there. So what does the system want to do? It wants to try and balance the scales back out. So it moves the position of the equilibrium to the right. So it throws some of the hydrogen nitrogen, sticks them together, and forms the ammonia. And vice versa, if you decrease the amount of hydrogen, then the position of the equilibrium moves to the left, as the system will try to increase the amount of hydrogen, tries to restore it, oppose what you are doing. Now, temperature, the final one. This is probably the trickiest. However, it can be broken down and 
when you get the hang of it, it is almost exactly like concentration. So you will always be told the value here. So minus 92 kilojoules per mole, and that is for the forward reaction. So left to right. You should know being minus, it is an exothermic reaction. So the forward route is exothermic. So going, so sticking hydrogen and nitrogen together to make ammonia releases energy. Now the easiest way I find to tackle this question is as long as you can write energy on the correct side so the forward route releases energy and the reverse route being endothermic combines energy with ammonia to make hydrogen and nitrogen. As long as you get energy on the right side then you can treat that exactly like a concentration. So now, if I decrease the temperature, what am I doing to the energy? I'm decreasing it. I'm decreasing the amount of kinetic energy. So if I lower the temperature, I am lowering this value. So what will the system want to try and do? It wants to oppose it. So the way it will do that is it will move to the right. In moving to the right, you increase the amount of ammonia, but you also increase the amount of energy. So again, if you want to tackle that in an exam style question, what would be the effect of a decrease of temperature on say the yield of ammonia? One, stay capped and obvious. The forward route is exothermic. Therefore, a decrease in temperature would move the position of the equilibrium to the right, reason why the system is trying to increase the amount of energy it's trying to release heat as such to counteract what you've taken away because you cool it down so the system tries to heat things back up obviously all of that vice versa if you increase the temperature so if you increase the temperature then what you could say is either talk about the reverse being endo or again, just stay at the forward as XO. If you increase energy, the system will move to the left to absorb heat or to lower the energy as such. Any word like that to describe it. Mark schemes do normally have four or five options. As long as you actually know what you are talking about, then you can usually pick up the mark fairly straightforward. And in terms of this being an industrial process, the final thing to link onto is a bit of economics. As we said, all of it is to make money. So you need to be thinking, what conditions do I have to do this under? Now we said before, an increase in pressure would increase the amount of our ammonia. However, what pressure do you want to use? Do you want to use 200,000 kilopascals, 500,000, million? 1 billion kilopascals, you have to make a compromise. The reason is, in your industrial power plant, if you keep increasing the pressure, then you've got to increase all the thickness of the pipes to withstand that pressure. That costs money. So you do accept a bit of a compromise in terms of saying, well, I'll have all my pipes X thickness because it's reasonably cheap to set the plant up and I will accept that my yield will just be 70% because I don't want to pay the extra millions and millions to reinforce every pipe and get say 73%. Likewise for temperature, temperature brings in a bit of the kinetic side of it. In this we said a lower temperature would increase the amount of ammonia. However a lower temperature, what does that do to the rate? Well yes, it kills it. So you might get a 99% yield if you do it really close, do it that close, low temperature. However, you'll probably be dead by the time you get that yield. So they do it at a reasonably middle-ish high temperature because yes, it's a lower yield, but you get it out fast and you get your money from it. It isn't sort of your optimum return of cash. However, as I said, it's all a compromise. And obviously providing temperature costs money, need to burn fuel to get that heat source. In terms of concentration, we don't want to waste things. 
In the harbour process, what they do is in the final stage, they cool it right down.